Morning Journey Church family. If you're not already, would you stand to your feet and worship with us today? Let's put our hands together as we start to sing. Come on. Why don't you turn and find somebody you don't know? Introduce yourself today. Church, do you believe that? Your presence, your presence 
hands together. We're going to lift our voices in faith today. We know that our breakthrough is coming. Come on, lift your voice together with me. It says this, may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is for us. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. My prayer for us today as we worship is that we would experience the love of Christ. It is so freely poured out for us today. There's nothing like it in the world. We've never known anything like it. Let's sing that. Come on. 
never been, there will never be a God like you, a love so true, there's never been, we believe, there will never be a God like you, a love so true. Come on, lift your voice. There's never been. Never be a God like you, love so true. pour out on us today, Lord. We lift our praise and we offer it right back to you. Sing it out. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell
journey. Man, isn't it good that we serve a good, good father. Amen? Come on, journey. Just give God a shout of praise real quick before we take a seat. I love it. Man, do me a favor. Just welcome someone around you to journey as you take your seats. For those of you watching online right now, we are so glad that you're watching with us. Man, tell us where you're engaging from, watching from, regardless of where you are around the country. Welcome to Journey. But for those of you that are right here in this building, we're so glad that you guys are here. Man, welcome to Journey. Come on. Man, it's so exciting to be able to worship alongside of you guys this morning. As my name is Chad, and I'm one of the pastors right here at this campus, and it is so great to have all of you here. Matter of fact, there's probably in a room this size some of you that are here for the very first time. Could you do me a big favor if you are? Could you just take out this connection card that's on your seat? There's a pen attached to it. All you need to do is fill this card out, take a couple of seconds, and at the very end of the service, you can do one of two things with it. You can either place it in one of our red giving bins that are out by our doors if you're in a rush, or guys, myself, our team, we would love to connect with you after service in the welcome room right behind our cafe. You're, you'll notice it. It's a glass wall. Just go ahead right in there. We would love to connect with you, welcome you to Journey, grab this card from you, and then have a chance to welcome you to Journey a little bit later on this week as well. We're so glad that you're here. As you fill this card out, guys, I was just talking to our kids team earlier today, and they were telling me about a story uh, of one of their leaders, actually a couple of their leaders, Alicia and Brian. Guys, these guys started to serve over in our kids' ministry some months back, and they did that because their kids were having a hard time going into the kids' ministry, and they realized the importance of having their children over in kids' ministry so they could come in here and, and enjoy service and receive what God would want for them. And so what they decided to do is go and serve over in kids' ministry in their kids' classroom so that their children would feel comfortable and then serve uh, and come over here to service. And so here's the thing, a few months went by, their kids started to really engage with the room. They no longer needed mom and dad in their room, so they transitioned to another room inside of kids' ministry. Now their kids are doing well, they're serving in another area, they're able to attend service together and receive what God would have for them, and not only are they serving on Sundays, but they're also serving on our curriculum team. They're doing other things, and they're watching their community as they serve as leaders over in our kids' ministry build. They are so faithful. They are so incredible. As a matter of fact, their story uh, goes something like this. They were planning on moving maybe back to their hometown, and they decided to not move because of the impact that Journey Church was having on their family and the family that they built right here. I'm like, man, I love those of you that serve in any capacity, but those of you that serve over in kids, thank you so much for your faithfulness. What you do in impacting lives, my kids included, you are transforming the lives of the children of this church. And there might be some of you in here, and you're not connected anywhere yet. You're not serving anywhere yet. Or, or maybe you're looking for a place to get involved. I want to encourage you after service to go talk to our kids team. They're out in the lobby. There's an orange tent there. If you're looking for an incredible place to get involved, make a difference, make a massive impact in somebody's life, including your own, I would encourage you to go talk to them over there. They would love to connect with you. We have a lot of room right now in our 1230 service that would love some leaders just like you to be a part of, but we always need leaders in every service. So after service, make sure to go talk to them. God is doing some great things over there for sure. And the cool part is Journey Kids is just ramping up for the summer. Actually, next Sunday on the 30th at 5.30 p.m., we have a summer movie night from Journey Kids, which is going to be a ton of fun. It's going to be right in here. If you've been to one in the past, you'll love it. We are going to be watching Smallfoot. It is going to be just a fun time for you and your family to come and engage here, have some popcorn, enjoy some pizza. So whatever it is, just come and be a part of it next weekend at 5.30. Get out of the heat. It is hot outside already, guys. Listen. And get into some air conditioning. Watch, some, uh, watch a movie together as a family. It's going to be fun. And guys, listen. We are actually wrapping up our series, The Little Things, this weekend. God has been doing wonderful things over the last three weeks. And this weekend is going to be no exception. As a matter of fact, we have our campus pastor, Zach Taylor, over at our Boynton location. It's going to be teaching today. Come on, Lake Worth. Let's get excited for Zach. Listen, you may not know Zach, you may not have met Zach, but I promise you that the message that God has placed in his heart today is going to transform your life. It's going to change how you view your life and how 
you view your relationship with God as we look at the little things that allow God to do the very big things. Can we just do something here in a minute? When he comes out after this bumper, can you do me a favor and just welcome him to Journey Church, the Journey Church Lake Worth Way? Can you just celebrate, scream, holler? Man, I want him to feel welcome so that God can use him in a mighty way. I'm so excited that y'all are here today. Welcome to Journey. Journey Church. Good morning, Lake Worth. Thank you for letting me be here with you this morning. My name is Zach, and I am just so excited about this morning. I want to give a shout out, though, to my people over in Boyne. Love you guys more than you know, and to all of our online community. Yeah, we can celebrate them. Hey, Lake Worth, I want you to know that you're a part of something huge going on all across Palm Beach County, in Boynton, and all across the world. God is on the move, and people are tuning in to what's happening right here in front of you every day. So can we just welcome those people into the room? I also want to give a shout out to our pastors, Scott and Raquel. We love you guys so much. One year ago, you invited Casey and I into your life, into your church, and into your family, and my life has been forever changed because of you. So thank you so much. Can we love on our pastors in this place? Well, hey, we are in the middle of this series called The Little Things, and what it's all about is that we believe that God wants to use these little things in our life to do some big, incredible, amazing things. And so the little thing that I believe that God is calling us to today is this little thing called defining the relationship. And I believe that God wants us to answer this question today, where do we stand in relationship with God? But it's a complicated question because relationships are just a complicated thing, aren't they? Any sort of relationship is a complicated thing. And what I want to do today is actually define our relationship with God and define how he feels about us because those relationships can be complicated. I'll give you an example of this for Casey and I. See, we've been dating about three months, and I'm beginning to fall for this girl. It's getting serious, and I'll tell you how serious it's getting. She's going to cook her first meal for me. Okay. (laughs) We're on the same page here. So there's a lot on the line for her, and I show up to dinner, and I am so excited. I can't wait. And she's lit candles all over the place. It's this beautiful spread. She looks gorgeous in her dress, and I'm so excited for dinner. And I sit down. The plate's in front of me. Casey goes to the kitchen, and she grabs the food, and she sets it in front of me. And what is sitting in front of me is a casserole. And if you guys know anything about me, you guys in Boyne definitely know this. I hate casserole. All right, casserole, you take the best things in life, the potatoes, the bacon, the cheese, the butter, all of these are good things, and then they sneak onions into it, and I hate onions. Anyone with me here, like, just hating onions? Thank you. All right. You understand where I'm at. But again, relationships are complicated, aren't they? And so this is an important moment in the relationship. I've got to handle this with delicacy, but I have to set a precedent because I'm not going to be living my whole life eating onions, right? Okay, you're with me. You're with me. And man, over in Boynton over there, you guys just need to know, Casey's there with you today. If she tells you any sort of story that doesn't sound exactly like mine, don't listen to her at all. This is exactly what happened. I got down on both knees and I grabbed her hands in mine and I said, you are so beautiful, those blue eyes staring right back at me. And I said, your dress is so gorgeous. I'm so glad you made me dinner. I think I read her a poem, serenaded her with a song, grabbed my guitar, played for her and whispered sweet nothings in her ear. And at the end of all that, I said, maybe next time, if you're okay with this, perhaps. Just, I mean, just up to you, but, but maybe next time we just won't put onions in the food. And guys, I got to tell you, those blue eyes turned into bright, fiery stares going right through me. And I remember tables flipping. I remember the words being said, how dare you? I remember ducking because plates and napkins and forks are being thrown across the room. And at the end of the night, 
I remember being in a room, destruction all around me, all by myself, wondering what just happened. Relationships are complicated, aren't they? But it gets more complicated because the next day I'm graduating, and my family's coming into town to see me graduate, and I've been talking up this girl named Casey to them, and they're so excited to meet them. And how am I going to introduce my family to someone who would dare to put onions in my food? <laughs> So in response to our fight, I sent this text over to Casey. I said, we need to talk. It's time to determine the relationship. And some of the single people in the room, you see those four words, and it creates a little bit of a pit in your stomach, doesn't it? And so that was at 8 a.m. May 21st, 2011, that I sent that text. 10 a.m. May 21st, 2011, I sat down across the table for coffee and I said, Casey, we need to break up. And she said, why? I said, don't you remember the fight from last night? And she looked at me with so much confusion. And she said, are you breaking up with me over onions? <laughs> I said, no, no, no. Like the fight and the... You put onions in the casserole. What are you doing? Like, you know I don't like onions. <laughs> and so I broke up with her that day. Except that she said, no, we're not breaking up. And I was so confused. And she stood up right where she was at. And she turned back around to me and she said, we have lunch with your family at noon. You better be there. She said, you have graduation tonight at 6 o'clock. Wear your white shirt and you better be there. And I'll see you then. And she walked out of the coffee shop. Now you know the sort of girl that I married, and at 6 o'clock, we took this picture, May 21st, 2011, and there I am, wearing my white shirt, being a dutiful boyfriend, aren't I? You guys are celebrating Casey, but no one's celebrating me in this moment. I showed up, guys. Relationships are complicated, aren't they? And that's with someone that we can see, that we can touch, that we can feel that's close to us, someone that we can talk to on a regular basis. How much more complicated is our relationship with God? And we can't always feel him or touch him or see him or recognize that he's near us. So it gets a good bit more complicated. And so when we ask this question of where do we stand with God, I think it's a question that we all recognize somewhere deep down inside of us. I'll prove it to you. Here we go. We'll just survey the room real quick over in Boyne. You guys got to help me out with this. Raise your hand right now if you believe that God loves you. With everything that you have, raise your hand if you believe God loves you. All right, take a second. Look around the room. Man, you guys got it right. That's the correct answer. All right, raise your other hand if you believe God likes you. Oh, relationships are complicated. And so here's what I think. I think there's some people that walked into this room that were once close to God but now feel like he's distant or not there altogether. I think there's some people in this room that aren't even sure how they feel about God. They know that he exists, but he doesn't really affect how they live their life. I know that there's some people in this room that for years have been showing up to church, reading their Bible, praying, and doing everything right in their life, but they're not sure why. I think there's someone in this room who isn't sure about how God feels about them at any given point. Maybe he's mad. Maybe he's angry. Maybe he's disappointed. Maybe he's sad. And so what I want to do is I want to define the relationship. I want to answer this question once and for all. Where do we stand in relation to God? Because the answer to that question will define our entire faith. Even more so, I think it has the ability to alter our entire life. So can we define the relationship together, Journey Church? Is that okay with you? Thank you. All right, let's turn to Luke 15 then. And Luke 15 uh, is this moment. You guys can flip there. We'll also have the, the slides up on, on the screen. Luke 15 is this moment where Jesus is asked this question, why do you hang out with sinners and tax collectors and all these terrible people? And instead of just answering the question straight up, Jesus does this thing where he tells three parables. And parables are just earthly stories with heavenly meanings, and Jesus uses them to teach lessons to the people. And so instead of answering directly, he tells three stories. He tells a story of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And here's my hope, is at the end of these three stories, as we walk through them, we will know exactly how God feels about us. I also hope at the end of these three stories, we'll get to this point where we begin to decide for ourselves how we feel about God. 
So let's jump into the first story. It's in Luke 15, verse 4. It's the story of the lost sheep. Here's how it goes. It says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And so our first main character is a shepherd. And a lot of times when I think about a shepherd, I think about a guy who's just sitting there petting and loving his sheep, and it's this sweet moment with the sheep and everything like that. Um, But in biblical times, a shepherd, their main job actually isn't to love sheep. The main job of the shepherd is actually to protect sheep from danger. One of the most dangerous jobs at this time was to actually be a shepherd. David in the Old Testament talks about his time as a shepherd. He talks about how he fought off wolves and lions and bears to protect his sheep. He heard their cry. He ran out and he chased after them. And so that's the role of a shepherd is to hear the cries of the sheep and to step in front and protect them from harm's way to rescue them. And one of the things that I love about Jesus is in two sentences, he can recap the entire story of the Bible. Watch how this works. You go all the way back to the beginning that God created us in his image. Humanity turns their back on God. They run away from God, and that introduces all sorts of brokenness into the world. And from that brokenness, you see this pain, you see this destruction. And then all of a sudden, humanity begins to cry out to God for help to save humanity from what's happening. And that's when Jesus enters into the scene because he hears the cry and when a shepherd hears the cry of someone wounded of a sheep wounded he responds in rescue and journey church do you know how powerful it is in a moment when you need rescue for rescue to come it's so powerful may 22nd 2011 one day after my graduation one day after that beautiful picture with casey an ef5 tornado came through and ravaged the city of Joplin, Missouri, the city that we were in. It was the deadliest and most costly tornado in U.S. history. In a matter of 30 minutes, the entirety, 66% of my city of 66,000 people was reduced to absolute rubble. There was nothing left. This tornado destroyed absolutely everything. And that night, I actually got to walk through the chaos and the destruction. I got to walk through everything that was going on. And there are so many images when you see that sort of destruction and that sort of chaos. There's so many memories from that night, um, but I don't remember everything. I just remember these vivid images of these families as they're walking out of the rubble, having lost everything, of just having blank faces because there's just nothing there. I remember going to, to these holes in the ground, giant holes in the ground where a house once stood but no longer does. I remember stepping over power lines that had been downed. I remember seeing cars mangled on top of each other. One of the most vivid memories is getting to 20th in Connecticut, these cross streets in Joplin, the very epicenter of the storm, and I could look for a half mile south, a half mile north, two miles east and two miles west, and I could see because there was nothing standing in the way because the tornado had leveled everything, and so I could see for miles in every direction. And in the middle of that chaos, Joplin put out a cry for help. They put out a cry for help, and the number one memory that I have from that night, it's not all the darkness or the pain or the sadness. The number one memory I have from that night were the lights. The lights from the surrounding towns of Southwest Missouri sending in the Calvary, sending in their rescue, sending in their help from the first responders, the paramedics and the fire trucks that began rolling into town. And at first it was Duquesne and Webb City and all of these local towns. And then all of a sudden you started to see these towns and cities that I'd never heard of, cities in Oklahoma, Arkansas and Kansas, put out a call for rescue and the people showed up, the world showed up in these amazing fashions. And so the memory that I have in my mind is this light descending into the darkness to rescue. And I believe that that's the best image of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus says that I am the good shepherd and the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And here's what I believe that Jesus does. He steps out of his safety, out of where he was at, out of heaven. He descends down into earth on a rescue mission on our behalf because he loves loves us and he chases us down and it ultimately costs him his life. He gives his life for us and on our behalf. And so here's what I want us to remember. Here's what I want us to remember. Our rescue didn't cost us anything, but that doesn't mean it was free. Jesus gave everything because he's a great shepherd and that's what shepherds 
do is they hear our cry. They hear the cry of the lost sheep, and they descend into the chaos to bring rescue, and it cost them everything. So our rescue didn't cost us anything, but that doesn't mean it was free. And here's what I love about Jesus' parable, is that the shepherd leaves 99 to go and rescue one. And what I think that tells us is that Jesus would do it again. And he would do it again if it was just you. He would do it again if it was just one because that's how Jesus feels about you. And so he's sitting here defining the relationship, saying, I would give everything for you. Amen? Amen. And here's what I found, though, in my own life. Even though I've heard that a million times, it's still hard to remember and it's sometimes hard to believe. So Jesus tells a second parable. He tells the parable of a lost coin. We'll pick it up right here. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses just one. Doesn't she lie to lamps, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls all her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. And what Jesus is doing across these three parables, catch this, is he's actually introducing this thing called the Trinity. And what we believe is that God is one God, but he has three persons. There's the Father, and then there's the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if you tore through all three parables, the first parable is about this great shepherd, and that's Jesus who descends down and gives his life. The final parable is about this Father who loves the Son and welcomes him home. And so that obviously represents the Father. And so we have the second parable with the woman. And that represents the Holy Spirit, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we know that Jesus is pointing to the Holy Spirit because all throughout the scriptures, a lot of times you'll see the Holy Spirit actually described in these feminine terms as a way to, to metaphorically explain who the Holy Spirit is. Uh, also, what the woman does in the parable is really similar to what the Holy Spirit does in our life. Notice that she lights a lamp, and then she begins to hover and scour over the floor, trying to find the thing that she's lost. She illuminates what's happening. And here's what I found in my life, is that this is exactly what the Holy Spirit does to me. The Holy Spirit pushes me and nudges me and lights a light in my life to remind me who I am, to remind me that I'm not lost, and to find me in those darkest moments. And so when I'm about to step away from God, when I'm about to do something that I know that I shouldn't, there's this voice from the Holy Spirit inside of me that points and says, that's not who you are. You're worth so much more than that. And that's what the woman is doing, is she's lighting up to see the value that lays in front of her. And if you look at these coins, they're actually made of silver. And I think it's fascinating that Jesus doesn't use gold or diamonds or jewel to describe the value of the coin. He uses silver. But he does this for a reason. See, silver is not the most precious metal. But if you go and you take a stamp of the emperor, you put a stamp of the king and the name of the king on a silver coin, do you know what it's worth? A whole lot more because now it's turned into currency. And so what Jesus is telling us about ourselves is that from the very beginning, we were stamped with the image of our king on us. We were stamped with his name on us. And so regardless of what we do, regardless of who we are, we actually have value because of the name and the face of our king being imprinted on us. And so no matter what we've done, no matter where we go, that stays with us. So watch how this works. Watch how we're paying attention here. The value of something is not determined by who you are or by what you've done. It's actually determined by whose you are and what he has done. And so because God has placed his stamp on us, he's placed his image on us and his name on us, we have value and that's not something that we can take away and it's something that the Holy Spirit constantly reminds us of over and over and over again that we have value and that we have worth because we belong to our King. But also, pay attention to this. We have an enemy out there, don't we? And that enemy wants to take away that value. And while the Holy Spirit wants to remind us of whose we are, the enemy wants to remind us of what we've done. And so he will spread lies and he will infiltrate inside of us and whisper things to our ears that just aren't true. He'll say to us that God is disappointed in you because you didn't do a good enough, good enough job raising your kids. 
He'll whisper in your ear that God has turned his back on you because you can't seem to manage your addiction. He'll tell you this lie that God's not going to give you that promotion because you haven't been very kind to your spouse lately. He'll remind you that God is just angry at you because you let God down. He's saying that God is punishing you because you haven't been in church enough lately. You haven't been a good enough Christian. These are the lies that Satan wants to spread into our midst and into our beliefs. But remember this, we don't have value because of what we do. We have value because of whose we are. So can I read some scripture over you? Can I speak on behalf of the Holy Spirit right now and speak value over you? Ephesians 2 says this, that you are God's masterpiece. Galatians 4 says that you are God's heir. Ephesians 1 says that you are God's beloved. John 1 says that you are a child of God. Galatians 5 says you have been set free. Colossians 3 says you are chosen, you are holy, and you are blameless. So what that means is that God doesn't just love you. He he likes you. He delights in you. He's infatuated with you. He sits around counting the hairs on your head. So here's what I want you to know. Don't let Satan call trash what God values as treasure. You're worth so much more than that. You are treasured in every way. So we have a son a shepherd who gives his life on our behalf. We have a spirit who comes as a woman who, who lights our way back home so we can remember who we are and whose we are. And lastly, we have a father who's lost his son. Let's pick up the story in John 15. We got it here. But Luke 15, sorry about that. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Um, a lot of times we talk about the lost son as a prodigal son. And the word prodigal, and maybe in your text you can see it there, uh, it actually just means foolishly lavish. And it talks about the lifestyle that this son lives. He lives this foolishly lavish lifestyle. He goes to his father and he says, Father, you're dead to me. The only thing that you can give me is my inheritance. So give that to me and then I'm going to turn my back on you and walk away. And this foolishly lavish son, he goes and he spends the money wildly. His father's entire inheritance, all the money that the father's worked so hard to attain, he spends in a short amount of time. And even more than that, as he's living this wild lifestyle, he actually puts his father's name through the mud and he disgraces his family while doing it. And I'll just be honest with you. I don't know that I've ever gone to God and said, you're dead to me, you don't matter to me, just give me what I want. But I have gone to God and said, I don't want to do what you want me to do, and I'm going to do my own thing. I've turned my back on God over and over and over again and foolishly lived the life that I wanted to live. And so I think all of us can see a little bit of prodigal son in us, a little bit of lostness in us. And if you pay attention to the story, what ends up happening is the foolishly lavish lifestyle catches up to the son. And all of a sudden, he finds himself in desperate need. Famine comes, and brokenness enters in. And he finds himself eating the same food that the pigs are eating, living with the pigs. And he comes to his senses and says, this isn't the life that I want. I think I'm worth a little bit more than this. And so he makes a decision that he's going to go back to his father. And he's going to try to earn his father's favor back by serving him and becoming his slave. And so that's his plan. I'm not going to be a son. I'm going to become his slave. And he turns around and he goes back to the father. And here's what happens when he goes to the father. The son got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. The father ran to his son threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And every Jewish person that's sitting in the room listening to Jesus is disgusted as soon as Jesus gets to this point. I can imagine them standing up and spitting on the floor because the son doesn't deserve the love of the father. The son deserves to be slapped, not hugged. The son deserves to be embarrassed, to be shamed because of what he's done to the father and because of what he's done to the family. And every Jewish person there is sitting there thinking, the son needs to be punished. And instead, the father goes and gives him love. 
How does that happen? And I think in this story, here's, here's one of my favorite parts. Um, if you can bring it back up. Notice what the father does. He's scanning the horizon, and then he runs to his son. And when he runs to his son, Jesus is actually making a little bit of a joke here. And we just need a little bit of uh, first century context to make this make sense. And so if you are a Jewish man at the time and you're wealthy, you're gonna actually going to be wearing a tunic, which is just kind of a dress that goes above your knee. If you're wealthy, um, you also have access to fine foods and high quantities of fine foods. And so wealthy people at this time um, were actually a little bit more heavy set. They carried a lot more weight on them. And so imagine this, you're trying to run in a tunic when you're carrying extra weight. A short dress, extra weight. The second option of how the father can run to the son is that he can take his dress, he can take his tunic, he can take the front, and he can take the back, and he can tie a knot between his legs, pull it up like a diaper, and then run his way over to the son. And so when Jesus tells this story, here's the image he's conjuring up. Either the father is mooning everyone behind him or wearing an adult diaper running to the son. It's embarrassing. It's foolish. And Jesus tells the story that way on purpose because he's making a point. And what he's saying is that the father doesn't care about what he looks like. The father doesn't care about his pride, his status. He doesn't care what the son has done, where the son has been. He doesn't even care what's happened to the son. All that he cares about is that his son is home. And so the father runs to his son. He swings all wide his arms. He grabs hold of him. He says, welcome home, my son. And at Boynton, at our campus, um, there's a big sign right when you walk into the lobby, and the sign says, Welcome Home. And I love this sign because I think what it does is it sets out our purpose as a journey church and as a family. And a journey, here's what we believe. We want to love the exact same way that Jesus loved And we want to love the same sort of people that Jesus loved. And so here's what I'll tell you is that we don't care where you've been. We don't care what you've done. We don't care who you've done it with. What we care about is that you're home now. So welcome home. So if you walked into this place and you were skeptical or you were cynical or maybe even you felt sinful, welcome home. You walked in this place and you don't know where you stand with God, welcome home. You walked in this place and you thought the roof was going to cave in on you, welcome home. This place is for you. Amen. Journey. So the father opens up his arms wide. The son is grabbed in an embrace. And watch what the son does next. The son says to him, he pushes his father back and says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he says, let me earn your favor back. Let me pay you back for what I've done. There's something in us when we've let someone down. It makes us feel like we just have to pay them back. I'll give you an example of this. Casey and I were on a date, and we went to Silver Dollar City. And Silver Dollar City is just an amusement park, the finest amusement park in northwest Arkansas, by the way. And so we show up. We're riding roller coasters. We're having so much fun. It's just an absolute blast for us. But we're feeling a little bit tired. And so I thought, oh, we'll just go and do, like, kind of a calm, slow ride. So there's this kid's ride um, with water boats around the corner. I said, babe, let's go do the water boat thing. It'll be nice and relaxed, and we'll get a break. And so I jump on the water boat, and I quickly realize that there's like a water cannon um, sitting in front of us. And the little kids are supposed to go up and kind of slowly turn the thing, and it just shoots this nice stream. By the way, we're like the only adults without kids on the ride, so it's a little bit weird and awkward anyway. um, I learned really quickly that I'm way stronger than tiny children. (laughs) I also learned really quickly that if you pump your cannon, instead of shooting a tiny stream to hit the targets along the way, um, you can actually send out a jet stream. I also learned that they made a error when they designed this ride for children, and they didn't expect me to be on the ride, because it S's back and forth, and you go parallel with the boat next to you like a pirate ship. And so here's the image. You have all of these kids with their tiny streams of water going this way. And my boat pulls up, and I've got a jet stream going across. And right now, some of you guys are thinking, Zach's a terrible person because he's going to shoot children in the face with his jet stream water gun. And that is not the case. 
I will, however, shoot parents that are trying to help their kids in the face with my water gun. And so I come around the corner and I go parallel with the boat in front of me and I see the parents, they're there, weak and helpless, and I just hit them right in the face. Ooh, man, this is a good day. And then the boat behind me, I hit next, all the way, hit every single parent. This goes back and forth six times. By the sixth time, I'm like cheering because I'm champion of the world, feeling good about myself. I go around the final corner. There are children screaming because the parents have tossed them behind them. And now they have manned the water gun, and I am staring down six jet streams right at me. I'm like, I deserve this. So I go to accept my fate. I put my head down. This is my cross to bear. And when I put my head down, I notice this cute girl sitting in the front seat that's kind of ducking behind the water. And I had an escape plan. In the last second, the guns are coming at me. And the last second, I take Casey and I put her right in front of me. <laughs> 30 seconds later, the ride ends, and I am walking off completely dry. Parents in front of me are shouting and cursing my name. Parents behind me are getting off the road saying, that's the guy, complaining to the ride operators. I didn't care because I had won the day until I saw Casey. <laughs> Those eyes of fire were back, and they were burning right through me. And I'll just tell you, for the rest of the day, I was her slave. Baby, can I buy you some cotton candy? Can I get you a turkey leg? Do you want my coat? Because it dropped below 30 soon after. <laughs> Let me just get you something to warm up. I'm so sorry. How can I make it up to you? It's really hard to make it up to someone when they've sacrificed on your behalf, isn't it? And that's just with silly water guns on a kid's ride. How do we make up? the God of the universe who gave his entire life sacrificed on our behalf? How do we make up that wide of a gap? And the answer is it's just not possible. And so the son goes to the father and says, let me make it up to you and watch what the father says back. He says to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And there is so much imagery going on right here because here's what's happening. The robe has so much symbolism because what it means is that slaves run around naked, sons are clothed. The sandals mean so much. Slaves run around barefoot, but men that our sons wear sandals because their feet are too worthy to even touch the ground. And this ring is not just decoration. It actually is a signet ring that carries the family crest. And so the father is giving full authority back to his son. And so here's what is happening. See, God is not interested in slaves who can pay him back. He wants the son and the daughter that he's always loved. Slaves serve the father because their merit is based on the work that they can do and their ability to pay back the master. Sons serve the father because their name is on the company. Slaves earn their key, but sons have inherited it. And so he tells him he's not a slave, but he's a son. And I think that's a great message for us. So here's what I want us to know. Is we got to stop living like slaves because God has called us sons and daughters. Stop living like slaves because God has called us sons and daughters. I hope here's what you're catching. All three of these stories are saying the exact same thing. All three stories are saying that when something of immense value is lost, when someone that you love is lost, nothing else matters. The son gives up everything on this daunting rescue mission on our behalf. The spirit chases us down and lights our path back to who God has created us to be. The father opens his arms wide in acceptance of the sons and daughters coming home. When you've lost something that you love, nothing else matters. And on May 22nd, 2011, at 6 p.m., I learned this lesson. I'm standing at 20th and Connecticut. I could see a half mile south and a half mile north, two miles east and two miles west. My entire city is gone. I'm sitting at the epicenter of destruction. And I'd love to tell you that I ended up there because I was in a search and rescue mission or because I was trying to pastor people and love on them as they'd lost everything or because I was just trying to help. And that was not the case. I was there because I had lost something of value to me. 
See, a couple hours earlier, I'd gotten a call from Casey. And she told me that they had let her off work early because there was a storm coming and she needed to get home in time. And I'm talking to her on the phone. And as I'm talking to her, I can hear the hail coming down. I can hear the rain and the wind. I can hear the storm getting worse behind her. And all of a sudden, she stops talking altogether. And she just says these three words over and over and over again. It's all gone. It's all gone. It's all gone. And I'm saying, Casey, what's gone? What's gone? It's all gone. And the phone died. And what we didn't know at the time was that this EF5 tornado had split the town, the north side and the south side. Casey was on the south side. I was on the north side. And it went right between the two of us, three blocks north, three blocks south, and it would have hit either one of us. She managed to get a text through right before the cell coverage fell through. And she said, I'm at 20th and Connecticut. I texted her back, stay there. I'm on my way. And my rescue mission began. And I walked all the way two hours later to 20th and Connecticut. And I got there and I saw her car. And I realized, oh, it's going to be okay. And I went to the car. And she wasn't there. And in that moment... I started to run through all the images of that day. I started to run through the hole in the ground where houses once stood. I thought, is she there? I started to think about the cars that were crashed on top of each other. I thought, is she there? What has happened to her? I started to think about the lights that were coming into town, the lights that were leaving town, taking care of people who had been injured. And I thought, is she there? Where is this one that's so valuable to me? Where is she at? I came to rescue her, and she's not here. I just crumpled to the floor. I just began to cry. Because something of immense value was lost to me. And I felt in my back pocket a vibration. And somehow Casey had managed to get a call through to me. And this image popped up on my phone. And this picture is eight years old. And I'll just tell you, even to this day, it's the same image that's on my phone. And every time she calls, I'm reminded of how much I love her and how valuable she is to me and that she was safe. And I picked up the phone in desperation. I said, are you safe? Are you okay? And she said, yes. And I breathed heavy. She said, I'm at the college. I said, wait there. I'll be there in a second. And I sprinted over to the school as quickly as I could. And before I could even put my car in park, I had jumped out because I saw her on the horizon. And I ran to her. And I took my arms and I rubbed grabbed hold of her tighter than anyone that I've ever held before. I took her face into my hands and I held it this close and for the first time that day I said I love you. I love you and I never want to let you go. Lake Worth Boynton online if you can hear my voice here's what Jesus is telling you he's saying I gave everything for you because I love you and I never want to let you go the Holy Spirit is saying you are worth so much more than this I love you and I never want to let you go the father is saying welcome home my son and daughter I love you and I never want to let you go one of the hardest parts of this story though that the son has a choice of whether he wants to come home, doesn't he? And we always have a choice if we want to listen to the Holy Spirit's call in our life or if we want the son to rescue us. And so it comes down to this point. It's time to define the relationship. And I'm just going to ask you a simple question. He chose you. God chose you. Here's the simple question. Will you I just want to give you guys a minute to reflect on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to stay seated. Um, The band's going to come up here. We're actually going to play a song. And while we're sitting there, we want you to just reflect on those words and reflect on this question. God chose you. Will you choose him? While you sit there, though, can I pray over you? Lord, thank you for choosing us, for chasing us down, for rescuing us. Lord, if there's someone in this room who has stepped away from you, remind them that you want them to come home. Lord, if there's someone who's forgot their value, forgot their worth, Lord, remind them that you chose them and that you have valued them. Lord, if there's someone in this room who's never faltered, 
Help them to remember why they chose you so many years ago. It's in your name we pray. Amen. time with this message that's because you struggle with the idea of God choosing you but he did and he would do it again and his arms are open wide his coat is ready for you this is your moment the God that created everything gave everything did it for you so as we continue in prayer if you're in here and you have never made the decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord the Savior and the leader of your life maybe you're online and you've never done this either I want to give you the chance to do that right now loves you and he wants your eternity to look a lot different than it does right now and he wants your life to look a lot different than it does right now and if you're in here all over this room and you want to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord, the Savior and the leader of your life realizing that you don't have all the answers but you are going to connect yourself to the one that does, if that is you in this place All over this room, all I want you to do is slip up your hand and say, yes, Chad, I want Jesus as my Lord, as my Savior, as my leader. Right now, just all over this room, lift your hand up right now. No one's looking around. Everyone's in prayer. But if that's you, you're saying, Chad, this is me. I want want Jesus in my life as my Lord. Raise him up high. It's a bold move. Yeah. So many of you right now. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. And then afterwards. There's some of you in here, man, a lot of you in here, that you know Jesus is Lord and Savior. And right now, all heaven is rejoicing for those that have just made that decision. And we're going to stand together after this prayer. And we're going to worship. And those of you that just made this decision, you're going to sing words out for the very first time in relationship with the Father who loves you, who cares for you, and has given everything for you. Let's pray now. Just believe in your heart. Say this in your heart. Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ to come to this earth, to die on a cross for me, to take my sin, my shame, my guilt. And today, Jesus, I turn away from my sin and I turn towards you, believing that you can guide and lead and direct me. Help me. Change me. Make me brand new as I follow you every day of my life. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Come on, Journey, celebrate. Let's stand.
and continue to worship together. Come on. Come on, sing this. And oh, what a Savior, isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. We bow down, oh bow down before Him, for He is Lord. with those who just made that decision. Come on, all heaven rejoices. And I want this place to rejoice for the King who can save souls, change lives, and who can change eternities. Come on, Journey Church. Yes. Man, you guys can take a seat for a minute. Listen, for those of you that just made that decision, no one's getting up, no one's moving around. As we talked about a few weeks ago, sometimes we can unintentionally be the distraction that would keep someone from taking their next step in faith with Christ. But for those of you that just raised your hand, as your pastor, I want to say well done. Well done. Come on. Well done. There is no better decision you'll ever make in your life. And I want to celebrate with you. Our team, our staff. We want to come alongside of you. We want to walk this journey with you. You are not alone, and we're never meant to be that way. So here's what I would love for you to do. On this card that we talked about earlier, this connection card, right in the middle, it says spiritual decision. Here's what I would love for you to do. Make sure this card's filled out. Check that box. And at the end of this service, you can do a few things. You can either come up to our prayer team, because they would love to pray for you and celebrate what God is about to do in your life. Or you can come over to the welcome room. We would love to grab this card from you. We would love to pray with you, stand with you, and we're going to give you a call this week and celebrate all that God is doing in your life and figure out how we can come alongside of you and just, man, walk this walk out with you. We are so excited. We are honored that you have made that decision. Your life is different from this point on. Journey Church, let's celebrate one more time for those who made that decision. Seriously, make sure to fill this card out for sure. But Journey, man, we got a lot of wonderful things going on. I want to make sure that you're a part of it. If you wanted to get connected into kids, our kids tents out there, go over, talk to them. See how you can be a part of what God is doing right here at Journey. And uh, man, I love you guys. I love this message. And I've loved this series. I pray that every single one of us leave here changed, different, and whole in Christ. Journey Church, we say it all the time. We will not conform, but we will live transform. We love you so much. Well, hey, Journey, what a great message today. If this message spoke to you in any way, we would love to hear about it. Email us at prayer at gojourneychurch.com. Also, follow us on social media. Our username is gojourneychurch, and you can search us on Facebook and Instagram. And stay up to date with what's going on here at Journey. Just search Journey Church in your mobile device's app store to download our app. And as God continues to move into your life, Remember that we will not conform, we will live transformed. We'll see you next week.